Good afternoon, guys. We'll wrap up our New Deal uh, uh, video lecture with the uh, with the video that we've got right here. We'll be doing our review session Sunday night. Uh, sorry, Monday night at 7 p.m. Uh, so we're able to take our test on Tuesday. Um, and remember, any questions you guys have will be uh, will be totally okay. Um, so we're able to answer any questions you guys might have. Remember also that while you're working with the remainder of the video, you're going to be using this sheet um, to try to complete each of these fields by the time you come to class on on Tuesday. Um, you'll want to put into this box a description and the impact of what happened with these programs, not bullet points, but actually writing them out. And then over in this box, you're going to choose the one of the three R's, Relief, Recovery, or Reform, that you think best fits with this program's description. And you're going to be explaining why it should be seen in this sort of way. Um, and it's not going to be a fragmented sentence. You're trying to tie together all your analysis, kind of like you did with your short answer essay sets, so you're able to prove to a reader that you are able to, that you actually know um, that it would be relief because of these reasons and, and for what they were trying to do for the economy. So we'll, we'll get resuming with the, with the documentary that we're using, and then I'll be interspersing pretty regularly um, to help break down for you in common language what's taking place with, uh, with the uh, reforms that FDR is up to. Good luck. Roosevelt won a landslide election to become the 32nd president. FDR, the two-term governor of New York, brought a feeling of energy and optimism to the Oval Office. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. FDR's campaign song, Happy Days Are Here Again, was symbolic of his positive, take-charge approach as president. And with a Democratic majority in both houses of Congress, he was able to make swift reforms that became known as the New Deal. In just his first 100 days in office, FDR proposed and Congress approved more than 15 new pieces of legislation aimed at providing relief for the needy, recovery for the faltering economy, and reform of the American financial system. Just one day after becoming president, FDR declared a bank holiday, closing all banks and preventing any further withdrawals of money by depositors who had lost faith in the banking system. Then, he persuaded Congress to pass the Emergency Banking Relief Act, authorizing the U.S. Treasury Department to inspect the country's banks and allow only those that were financially solvent to reopen. The act offered loans to those banks which needed assistance. And with the creation of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, which provided federal insurance for bank depositors, Americans began to cautiously trust the banks once more. So you've seen a number of banking regulations that have just been created, so we want to break apart each of those for you guys. First of all, the Emergency Banking Relief Act is also known as the Bank Holiday, which should go into this spot right here. The Bank Holiday is going to shut down all the banks in the United States. It's going to then check them using people from the Department of the Treasury to check to see if they've got enough money to be solvent. And if they do, they're going to be allowed to reopen after a long weekend and after Roosevelt delivers fireside chat to say to people to leave their money in the bank if they trust the banking system and that he is uh, working to try to make sure that the banks stay okay. He's also going to go to banks that are uh, financially struggling, and he's going to fill them up with cash as well, um, so that they are then not going to collapse anytime soon. This is providing relief to the banks because they're going to be trying to figure, they're going to be able to have be strengthened, get more confidence from the people, and if they're able to work better and stay open, they're going to be able to then provide all the, the lending for buying a car or a house or other sorts of things that the economy is going to depend upon. The two other banking changes that we're going to see taking place are our reforms, Glass-Steagall and the FDIC, the Federal De Deposit Insurance Corporation. The way to picture Glass-Steagall is to, to picture the banking industry the way that it used to behave um, is that it would just be in one house. And so drawing it out for you guys, Imagine that this is the bank that we had during the 1900s and before. Those wildcat banks that we learned about with like Andrew Jackson or the ones that got involved in speculation, where they would take in savings, they would give out loans, but also they were prone to over speculation. 
feeling that Roosevelt has is that it's okay for banks to be doing these things, but we want to try to figure out how to create safe banks so that if you are just a, a person who wants to put in money, have it be saved, you'll be able to put it into someplace safe. And so that's what Glass-Steagall is going for. Glass-Steagall law is going to divide banks up. Some of them are going to be savings banks. They're going to be thoroughly boring. They're going to be just you know, taking in savings. They're going to be giving out loans. And they're going to have really strict regulations to make sure they're totally safe. If, on the other hand, you want to invest here, these are your investment banks, but they're going to be disconnected. So they could both be like Wells Fargo, but one of them is going to be doing the risky sort of banking. One of them is going to be doing the safe type of bank banking. If you're in the safe banks and they've got rules and regulations, what FDR is going to create is something called FDIC. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which means that your savings account is then going to be protected by a government insurance program. So if your bank gets robbed or burned down or blown up or whatever, all of those dollars are going to be safe. And so what FDR is trying to figure out how to do is if we can have crashes in the future that don't blow up our entire banking systems, that should make the, ba the, the economic crashes less painful. Unlike all the crashes we've had from like 1819 to 1837, 57, 73, 83, 93, 1907, 1929, when we just wipe out all the banks, um, that ends up clobbering the economy. So that's our banking reform. So we're going to see FDR uh, trying to put into place. The Federal Securities Act helped to restore public confidence in the stock market, as did the establishment of the Securities and Exchange Commission which prevented the manipulation of stock prices. So you've got two new things on your chart that they've just provided for you. The Securities Act is going to be dealing with the stock market, and it's going to create a series of rules to make the, the stock market less risky, especially focusing on the purchasing on margin and, and also other sorts of schemes that are meant to try to trap investors who are being swindled out of their money. The Securities Act is going to be enforced on the next page by the Security and Exchange Commission, being created by the Security Exchange Act. And so it's going to be their job to be the regulators of the stock market to make sure people are obeying the new laws that have been created to try to make the stock market a more fair um, uh, place to trade. So if you are trading stocks, it's now required that people have to be honest about what they're selling and they have to be giving you information about how the business is doing. Um, so it's not going to be nearly as, as uh, old Wild West sort of behavior that you see uh, in the previous days. Perhaps the most confidence-inspiring action by the new president occurred only eight days after his inauguration. Roosevelt took to the airwaves as millions gathered around their radios for his first fireside chat. He explained in simple terms the steps he had taken to reform the American economy. Roosevelt's direct, personal approach to the American people was reassuring and helped him garner the support of Americans to enact several more policies in his push toward recovery. The Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, was formed to put young men to work. The CCC planted 200 million trees in the Great Plains to prevent future soil erosion and built roads, parks, and flood control systems. The pay was only $30 a month, but almost 3 million men got much needed employment. When you look at the CCC, it's going to be one of many programs that look very similar to one another. And so when you study the CCC, you'll want to make some sort of link between them and the PWA, the CWA, and the WPA. They are all very similar works programs, and they also are very similar to what Herbert Hoover was up to when he was creating public works with the building of, of Hoover Dam and other sorts of projects in the United States. For the CCC, though, this is a very simple program. What they're going to do is they're going to take kids about your age and a little bit older, and they're going to take them out into the country to build stuff out in the, out in the wilds. And what they're going to be doing, you can see from the term conservation, they're going to be working to build like parks and trails and roads and bridges out in rural areas. And they're going to be doing all of this work while they're being paid and fed and clothed and housed by the federal government. So you're, they're going to have camps. So the best way to think about that, this is imagine being like a summer camp counselor, um, and it's the same sort of thing where you're living on site and you're getting room and board. They are going to get paid a low amount of cash, and they're going to be expected to send most of that money back home to their family. And the idea is that this is going to be providing stimulus for the economy. So the term you want to use 
with these types of programs is these are meant to prime the pump. So if you've ever been to a farm and you've seen a well, when they drill down into the aquifer, which is a deep area underneath the ground that has got our, our water layer to it, that pipe is going to be sucking water out of the ground. And the way you create that suction is you pour water into the pipe. It then creates suction to bring that water from the aquifer up. And so that's going to create then a well that's going to bring you a lot of water. So you've just primed the pump. By adding a little water, it should give you a lot of water. In this case, priming the pump means that FDR is going to create programs that put some money back into the economy that people are spending in the hope that that demand is going to then create a, a reaction that helps the economy get moving. As more people spend money, that will then encourage more factories to start making more stuff because they've now got buyers of their things. The CCC is also meant to be temporary, and so this program is going to pay people so low that they're going to hopefully, when the economy turns, be offered a better job with even minimal wage, uh, wage, wage increases. And the hope is that this program will then disappear because their wages are not going to be able to compete with private businesses. So the hope is that this will just get people through with some relief and recovery, and that's still going to be the same thing that you see happening with the remainder of these programs. Finally, whenever you travel from this point forward, take a look for this acronym or others because you'll find them where, the, where these programs have been working. The CCC um, is all over the place in northern Minnesota, especially if you've been to Gooseberry Falls just north of Duluth. There were a lot of CCC programs up there to try to take wild areas and make them places that people could use uh, for, for nature. And so when you're out, uh, out and about, you'll be able to see these things um, as legacies to the building that they did. Meanwhile, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration provided $500 million in direct aid to the homeless, unemployed, and ill. That was your Federal Emergency Relief Administration. This is going to be the program that is giving away just straight dollar money, dollar amounts to people who are so desperately poor that they're struggling. You can see in the name itself, relief. Um, they will oftentimes refer to this as being on the dole, which means that you are getting direct money from the government without any expectation that you'll pay it back or work for that. What you'll notice is this is the only one of those programs like that. FDR is very much sensitive to the idea that he's going to be labeled as a socialist or a communist. And so while you're going to see socialist elements through a lot of these programs of the government either regulating businesses or providing safety nets, he very much has the same mentality that if people lose their work ethic and become dependent on the government, this will be a very dangerous place for, for the country to go. And so that's why you're going to find a lot of his relief programs have a work element connected to them that if you want to gain these, uh, the benefits of these programs, you have to work to earn those benefits. The New Deal also created the PWA, the Public Works Administration, which provided funds to the states so that they could build schools, libraries, and other community buildings and create jobs for their citizens. When the PWA failed to diminish unemployment quickly enough, Roosevelt launched the CWA, the Civil Works Administration. The CWA created more than 4 million jobs, and workers built 40,000 schools and a half million miles of roads. So these are your Public Works Administration and Civil Works Administrations, and they're just subsequent programs, one being done earlier than the other, but both trying to do the same thing with different budgets attached to them. What FDR is trying to do is he's trying to create different works programs at different times as he sees whether or not the programs are actually creating the impact that he wants. So he likes the CCC, but it's not causing the impact that he's looking for. And he's got a lot of people inside the cities who can't go out to the countryside and build conservation works. So these two uh, works projects right here are trying to build roads, bridges, schools, other sorts of other sorts of places um, while they can do their building um, on the cheap. So they're, they're trying to build up a bunch of infrastructure without a lot of money. One of the things that you'll find as we study this course is when the economy crashes, this is a great time to do building because you've got supplies that are cheap. You've also got workers that are cheap. The problem, though, is that tax revenue, revenues are down, and so this could drive you into debt. And that's the issue that Roosevelt's going to be wrestling with throughout our entire time here, is he's getting a lot of pressure from Republicans, Southern Democrats, and internally he also worries a lot about how much debt he's generating. Um, and so he's constantly trying to walk that line of trying to help stimulate as much as he can while also trying not to bankrupt the country. And so you're going to see that these programs have an impact, um, but they're not going to be large enough to actually turn the entire economy around. That's also the element you want to be studying when you're working your way through this unit, is the works program that will eventually turn around the economy 
is going to be World War II. When we enter into World War II, we will have an unlimited need for men to become soldiers and women uh, to enter into the factories. And we're going to need to mass produce to provide weapons, not just for America, but also France and England and all of our other allies. Um, and that will eventually be the works program that turns things around. But its budget is going to be much higher than anything that the New Deal was able to, to put forward. In June of 1933, FDR's administration was able to pass the National Industrial Recovery Act, NIRA. It established a code of fair practices for various industries and set prices to ensure fair competition. The act also recommended minimum wages and maximum hours for workers. Now, one of FDR's first programs is the National Industrial Recovery Act that goes along with the National Recovery Administration. And what FDR was trying to figure out is how to do something in a cooperationist way like Hoover did, where he wanted to work with businesses and with labor and with the government to create a partnership to turn the economy around. This program, though, is going to run into problems because he's asking the businesses and workers to make sacrifices for the good of the country. And he was very much ignoring the idea that businesses are in business to make money and they can also go bankrupt if they make bad financial decisions. So what he asked businesses to do is to keep workers employed and keep their wages high, even if there were a bunch of unemployed workers who'd be willing to work for less. He's asking the workers to not go on strike. And what he's saying to the businesses is if they follow the codes that are set up by the government in conjunction with the businesses, they get to display this blue eagle inside their businesses and on their products. The problem that FDR started running into, though, is that many businesses would show this blue eagle but not stick with the codes. So they would pretend like they were doing what they could to try to help turn things around. Also, do not get confused. This is not uh, the, the same as the National Rifle Association that we have nowadays. This NRA is obviously a different thing. Um, but for this program, it's going to fade out partially because of the Supreme Court action that's taken against it and partially because of the, the problem with cooperation. FDR is going to discover that he actually needs to do things on the governmental level um, to try to make change happen because the businesses voluntarily are, are going to make business decisions out of self-interest, which totally makes sense. Um, also, just as a side note to what we just saw in the Super Bowl, um, originally the Philadelphia Eagles uniforms were not green, they were blue to represent the fact that they are celebrating the Blue Eagle um, because they were founded around the same time period that this was, this was all taking place. So, so that's the impact that FDR is having uh, on the NFL. Meanwhile, the Tennessee Valley Authority was organized to build dams that provided electricity, flood control, and of course many jobs for poor farmers in several southern states. The program that you just saw, the Tennessee Valley Authority, is one of the most controversial of FDR's programs. And the reason why it was controversial is because he is going to be using the government to create a program that's going to provide relief, recovery, and reform in the southern part of the United States, in one of the poorest areas of the United States. So in this area, this would be where you'd find people who would be labeled as rednecks, crackers, or whatever other derogatory term you'd want to use, where from the beginning of our course, these are the people from Bacon's Rebellion on who are kind of the backcountry individuals who have been left behind by economic development. For, te for Franklin Roosevelt, he is planning on then using the Tennessee River Valley that is going to be running uh, through the state of Tennessee um, to try to build up a series of hydroelectric plants um, that will provide uh, all sorts of electricity inside the area. Now, these hydroelectric plants, he's planning on being built by poor people who are living in the area. So that's going to provide relief for these individuals because they're about to get jobs. It's going to provide recovery because it's going to electrify the entire area. And once they provide electricity in this area, he's also hoping that this will provide a reform where this will provide a baseline then to understand how much should electricity be costing in the United States. One of the issues that he's running into is there are many uh, electric, electrical companies that are getting monopolies, not just in their state, but in other states, to run the power grids. And because they're a monopoly, they could charge whatever they wanted to when it came to electricity. So when, Teddy wrote, uh, when Franklin Roosevelt builds the, the Tennessee Valley Authority, he'll electrify this area, but he's also making the government an owner of an electrical company that has the advantage of having the federal budget rather than having to run budget estimates for themselves. In this area is going to be the Muscle Shoals area. So Herbert Hoover had the opportunity to build this, and he thought it was getting too much government involvement into a private business, which felt way too much like socialism to him. So for the Tennessee Valley Authority, it's going to blend all three of the R's, relief, recovery, reform. It is going to revolutionize the area with providing electricity to the area, 
Um, but it also is uh, is seen as a, one of those controversial moments where FDR is very much creating a planned economy, which very much feels like it's leaving our capitalistic sort of ways um, and moving much more towards a socialistic viewpoint on how we, we take care of our economy. That same year, Roosevelt also submitted the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which limited crop production in order to increase crop prices and help reduce surplus. FDR's AAA is going to be a very controversial law because what he's going to do is he's going to demonstrate to you the law of unintended consequences where he's got a problem that needs to be solved by hurting another element of the economy if the government is going to get involved. It's largely why Hoover and Republicans are going to be criticizing FDR where by making decisions like the, the, the plan for the AAA, um, they're going to argue that he is hurting rather than helping the economy. So what he's going to do during the AAA is who, uh, Roosevelt realizes that farmers need to get higher prices for their crops and they need to do that by having less supply of food on the markets because that's driving down the, the price that they're getting. So he's going to set into work a, pro, a, a program where we're going to pay subsidies to farmers to not farm. We're going to pay them to get to grow less in the hopes that that will then stabilize the market prices and help farmers get a better price for their crops. It's controversial though because he announces this right at the time that they're they're doing planting and they've got food in the ground already. Um, and, and so FDR is going to make the announcement that they're going to be destroying food to try to manipulate the prices that are happening on the markets. Now, for people inside the cities who are starving, the idea that we're going to be destroying crops and we're going to be paying farmers not to farm is controversial. And the idea that we're trying to raise the price of food when a lot of people are losing their jobs is going to be controversial, too. But it also brings to bear the idea that FDR had a choice where he could have done something more radical, like nationalizing the farms, but then that would have brought the criticism of communism uh, to, to the forefront, that he was taking over all of these businesses instead of allowing them to be privately held. What we could also decide to do is we could allow farmers to keep defaulting on their loans, but then that would end up having banks go bankrupt. And so Roosevelt's facing a complicated situation where no matter what solution he chooses, he's probably going to end up with some people who are hurt by the, the plan that he's putting into effect. Despite launching all these wide-sweeping new pieces of legislation, some critics felt the administration still hadn't gone far enough in helping the poor and reforming the economy. Some feared the New Deal was mostly benefiting already wealthy business owners and that it gave too much power to the government. Even ex-president Herbert Hoover was a vocal critic of FDR's New Deal policies. We have seen the creation of a most gigantic spending bureaucracy. That is not only a reduction of your standard of living, but of your freedom and your hopes. By 1935, the Supreme Court decided that the NIRA was unconstitutional, saying that its enforcement of federal employment codes went beyond the government's powers. The following year, it held that the Agricultural Adjustment Act was unconstitutional as well, because agricultural controls and regulations should be decided by individual states. Dismayed and fearing conservatives and the Supreme Court might unravel the New Deal, FDR proposed an intriguing bill to Congress. Roosevelt's so-called court reform bill would have added six more justices to the Supreme Court. Justices he, as president, would nominate. It was obvious that FDR would choose those sympathetic to his New Deal policies. The proposal was promptly nicknamed the court packing bill. The bill failed and tarnished Roosevelt's image. Regardless, because of court resignations, the president was able to appoint seven new justices in the next four years who did support his policies. But FDR hadn't seen the last of his critics. So we're now four years into the Roosevelt presidency, and he's having trouble getting stuff done and keeping it done. You just saw that the Supreme Court is now intervening with the National Industrial Recovery Act and also with the uh, AAA. And so for Roosevelt, he feels like after getting reelected that change should be happening quicker, especially since the recovery hasn't taken place. And he feels like there's a lot of opposition to virtually everything he does. Well, Roosevelt's problems is he's seeing two groups of, of individuals inside Congress and inside the Supreme Court hold him uh, to, accountable to, to debts and keeping government smaller. Um, and those will be our Republicans and our Southern Democrats who are very much concerned about how much the government is growing during Roosevelt's presidency. 
We do see the Constitution change during this time to make the, the, post, uh, the, the lame duck session shorter, where we're going to have inaugurations in January instead of in March. Um, but for Franklin Roosevelt, he's running into problems where a number of his laws are being overturned by a Supreme Court that's arguing that, that the New Deal is socialism and it's going out of control. Even though the Congress has passed it, the President has approved it, they're arguing that their strict constructionism trumps Roosevelt's loose constructionism when it comes to this situation. So for Franklin Roosevelt, what he decides to do is he's going to engage in what's known as the court packing scheme. He is going to try to appoint six brand new justices that he gets to choose to try to change the Supreme Court from 9 to 15. Um, he is very much doing something that is, is very out of the norm. And so when he does what he's doing, he's assuming that he's so popular because he just got reelected that he'll be allowed to do this. Instead, the public goes bonkers, the Democrats go bonkers, and he very much sees this as a misstep where he's not doing something that is pop, uh, popular with the, po uh, the people themselves. He is figuring out, though, that if he passes legislation, it does take an amount of time for it to work through the system before it ends up as a Supreme Court case. And so the court case that is important for us to understand is Schechter versus the United States. It's also known as the sick chicken case, where this case was arguing that the government can't get involved in regulating how somebody regulates, raises their chickens if they're not involved in interstate trade. When that was found uh, uh, unconstitutional, when, when the New Deal programs regulating the agriculture was found unconstitutional, FDR is just going to tweak a brand new uh, AAA that he's hoping is going to be constitutional, or at least he's hoping to have new judges in place before it's ruled upon. Or even if it's ruled unconstitutional, it gives him a year or two of that program trying to work to make the economy better. And so he's in a cat and mouse game because he realizes he's only got a limited amount of time of control over the Congress and the presidency, and he also realizes that people are still radicalized, as you'll see from the next three individuals. Roman Catholic priest and radio broadcaster, Father Charles Coughlin, reached over 40 million listeners each week as he challenged the New Deal. Coughlin wanted a guaranteed annual income for Americans and a nationalization of banks. In time, however, his anti-Semitic comments cost him most of his supporters. Your documentary is being far too kind to Father Charles Coughlin. He's engaging in nativism and racism during his broadcast. So he starts off preaching um, the Catholic faith during his radio show, but then eventually he starts drifting into political commentary. And his argument is that the banks are controlled by Jewish people, and as a result, we should be thinking about taking away all the banks from the people who own them, especially the Jews, and make them nationalized so that we can make sure that there's not crashes happening in the future. As he starts becoming more and more anti-Semitic, he starts to lose his audience. But there are a number of people in our country who engaged in those views around the same time as the rise of Adolf Hitler, who rose to power in 1933 at the same time that Franklin Roosevelt did. Um, and so there's a surge of, of anti-Semitism that's happening around the world um, that we recognize with Father, with Father Charles Coughlin um, when he's making those charges. Dr. Francis Townsend, another outspoken opponent to FDR's policies, claimed Roosevelt wasn't doing enough to help the elderly. Townsend won widespread support with his demand for a national pension plan. This money to be collected by the government and returned directly to the people from whom it was collected in the form of pensions every 30 days. I feel bad for Dr. Francis Townsend because he's put into the section called A Day for Every Demagogue. And a demagogue is somebody who leads by their charismatic might um, and, and oftentimes is a force of, of nature um, in a negative sort of way. So they're, they're kind of a, a, a cult of personality that goes along with the, 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 strong, the strong leadership that they have. Um, Dr. Francis Townsend is just a guy who's got a pretty radical idea for the time period. He's arguing that uh, in, the in the 1930s, you've got some people who are older um, who can't go back to work. And if they go back to work, they're stealing a job from somebody your age um, who probably needs that money more than they should. And he's asking the question, if we're in a wealthy country, I, he says, I understand how we need to have people be accountable for working, but if you're over the age of 60, let's get them out of the workforce, let's get them in retirement because they, they've earned that opportunity inside of our society. So his deal is he wants to give everybody in the country over the age of 60 200 bucks a month um, that are taking from taxes of, on the rich, but the requirement is if they want another $200 next month, they'll have to spend that money entirely during that month, and then they'll be able to get 200 more. This is a straight relief program that he's anticipating, but it also will help out re with recovery, because if all of these older people are, are buying things, um, they will then be stimulating the economy by priming the pump, by spending money. 
your key with Dr. Francis Townsend is this is the, the forerunner of Social Security. And so that program um, very much is inspired by Frank, uh, Franklin Roosevelt responding to Townsend um, and, and tweaking that idea. Most vocal was Louisiana governor and then Senator Huey Long. Although a supporter of Roosevelt at first, later Long had nothing but criticism for him. The Kingfish, as Long was often called, intended to run for the presidency and championed a nationwide social program called Share Our Wealth. Well, we've had the promises from the president many, many times. And now we're wanting a fulfillment. No empty words, no empty messages mean anything to us. And no kind of law except one that gives employment and homes and comfort and education to our people will satisfy us in the least. A great many Americans agreed with the Kingfish, and more than 27,000 Share the Wealth Clubs sprang up across the country. In 1935, at the height of his popularity, Long was assassinated. Now you've just seen Huey Long, which many people look at as a, a very dangerous individual from the 1930s because he was a very charismatic leader. And what he's arguing for during this time period is very much more extreme than what Franklin Roosevelt was discussing as a, as a way to deal with the Great Depression. Many people also see him cut from the same mold as a Mussolini or a Hitler, where they've got a, a personality that is big, and they may like to make a lot of promises, but also when Huey Long was running the state of New, uh, Louisiana, he, he was known as being somebody who, if you were on his good side, you were fine. If you were on his bad side, he could do a lot of things legally to make your life miserable um, as a result of the power that he accumulated. So Huey Long, uh, he's famous for delivering a speech uh, during his stumping when he was trying to figure out ways to become president in 1936, where he would give a speech started off by, by saying, imagine you're at a picnic and all of a sudden John D. Uh, sorry, John D. Rockefeller walks up and, and cuts in front of the line and takes his arm and sweeps 98% of the food uh, onto his plate and then tries to walk away. You and I would both see, hey, uh, why don't you come back here, boy, and bring back some of that food. And so that's that was his way of saying that the rich are doing great, the poor aren't. His uh, slogan then was, uh, share our wealth. That was his program that he wanted to put in place. He felt that you could make up to a million dollars in a year in income, and he would not tax you. But then once you went above a million dollars, for every new million dollar increment, he would charge you a new percentage until you got to, I believe, about $12 million, when he would then charge you 100% income tax on any money you made over $12 million. He then promised to give people a brand new house, a brand new car, a brand new radio, 5,000 bucks, um, and, and you would be able to then listen to him as he was uh, telling you about the other great plans that he had. And many Americans around the country started building share our, our wealth programs because they loved what he was saying, although if you examine what he's talking about, he's essentially talking about uh, a, a form of communism, or at least uh, the shades of that, um, that made a lot of people really nervous. Um, so when he was assassinated in 1935, um, it was a signal to Franklin Roosevelt that, that there's individuals out there who are charismatic enough to be able to push an agenda that's much more aggressive than the New Deal. Um, and it signaled to Franklin Roosevelt that he can't be done with, uh, the, great, uh, with the New Deal programs um, because, first of all, they haven't fixed the Great Depression, but then secondarily, there are a lot of people pushing for more radical reform. Um, this is also one of the reasons why, about a decade ago, Barack Obama got into tons of trouble because when he flew in, to Cleveland, Ohio, when he was campaigning for president, um, he uh, went into an airport, and, and on the tarmac was a guy who uh, gained the moniker Joe the Plumber. And Joe the Plumber asked Barack Obama, why is it that I have to pay for, from a business that I built, taxes to pay for people um, who are down on their luck and should have been working harder for themselves? And, and Barack Obama infamously said to this individual, you and I have done really well. Um, and it's now time for us to share our wealth with others so that we can help them to get through this economic crash that we had in 2007. Um, choosing the phrase share our wealth and given the radical nature of Huey Long's ideas very much set off a number of people about Barack Obama confirming for themselves that he wasn't just a, a progressive, he was somebody who was a radical who was going to be doing stuff that was, was far beyond um, uh, just progressive ideas. And so that's a, a, co a connection to today that we saw very recently with our politics.
Despite his outspoken critics, FDR knew the economy had improved, but not as much as he'd hoped for. And so he launched, with the help of his humanitarian wife, Eleanor, the Second New Deal. Mrs. Roosevelt traveled the country from coast to coast, seeing the poverty and suffering, urging her husband to provide even more help to the needy. She became a kindly symbol of hope for the downtrodden, who regarded her as a personal friend. Thousands of children wrote to her, asking for help. FDR convinced Congress to pass more legislation to spur the economy, including a second Agricultural Adjustment Act, rewarding farmers that practice soil conservation and compensating farmers who cut production of soil-depleting crops like cotton and wheat. The Resettlement Administration loaned money to tenant farmers so they could buy their own land and established camps for migrant workers. The second New Deal's most ambitious program was the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. The WPA created more than 8 million jobs from 1935 to 1943 for a great many unskilled workers and professionals. The WPA constructed 850 airports, built or repaired 650,000 miles of America's roads, sewed more than 300 million articles of clothing for the needy, and erected 110,000 libraries, schools, and hospitals. Artists, authors, and musicians found work in the WPA too, painting murals on public buildings, writing, performing, and composing. The WPA is the biggest of the works programs you've learned about, so you should link it to the CWA, the PWA, and the CCC. And with the WPA, it's going to be hiring people to do jobs that are traditional construction jobs, but also hiring people to be musicians or artists or actors or, or anything you could possibly imagine. Hoover, uh, Roosevelt wants to find a way to put these individuals to work so he can put money into their pockets, but not do so for them being lazy and not doing anything. But he sees this as a way to prime the pump to turn the economy around, which is still struggling in 1935, even though it crashed six years earlier. This program is going to be criticized for, for being too much, um, and especially for uh, paying people for, do, uh, for doing things that are not uh, the, the mandatory jobs that are needed for the government to function. Um, while other people see it as a stimulus to be able to help people uh, to get through tough times who are willing to work, but they just can't find jobs to do what they're wanting to do. Um, so it's a controversial program, but it's going to be one of the elements to try to turn the economy around. A National Youth Administration was also created to provide aid and part-time employment for students in need. The Second New Deal also helped reform labor laws with the passage of the Wagner Act, which supported workers' rights to form unions, and the establishment of the National Labor Relations Board to prevent unfair labor practices. From 1933 to 1941, the number of union workers rose from 3 million to 8. Congress also passed the Fair Labor Standards Act, requiring minimum wages and maximum hours for workers. Despite the administration's pro-labor policies, strikes were prevalent and often led to violence. On Memorial Day 1937, 10 people lost their lives at the Republic Steel Strike in Chicago. Perhaps the most important legacy of the Second New Deal was the Social Security Act of 1935. For the first time, Americans over 65 years of age and their spouses had old age insurance. Jobless workers got unemployment compensation, and families with dependent children and the disabled received aid. So Social Security is going to be introduced in 1935, and Social Security has a history to it um, that's a little bit complicated. So it's become one of the most uh, prized uh, programs that are out there. In the last election, both presidential candidates Trump and Clinton agreed um, that Social Security should still continue to exist, that they wanted to protect it because it's something that protects old people and their ability to have some sort of income during a retirement. What happened, though, during the debate over Social Security is there was a fear that this would lead to income redistribution, that you would take money from the rich and you would then give it to the poor. And so when it's described as being an entitlement, it's, it's kind of a, a confusing term to use for this program because the way that Social Security works 
is that you are required to contribute pay from your income uh, in order to for you to be able to then claim Social Security. Uh, initially, they could only tax up to $3,000 of your income because the sales pitch they had to make for Republicans and Southern Democrats was that this wasn't a giveaway to poor people. This was instead an investment plan that you were investing in so that you could eventually retire. So what that meant is whether you were rich or poor, you had a certain amount of money that, of income that you would be taxed on for Social Security. And then beyond that number, you would not be charged any taxes for Social Security because you in the end are supposed to be able to get your money back like a pension rather than taking from the rich to pay the poor so that they can be retired. Currently, you can see that the max that they could take money away from is getting up into like the 100000 range um, so that if you're making millions of dollars inside of our country, only about a hundred some thousand is being taxed for Social Security. And the remainder is then tax free for Social Security um, because you would not then be reclaiming that. What that also means is there's no income limits on Social Security. So no matter how poor or how wealthy, if you've been contributing to that program, you then get to draw money out of that. This program, though, is intended to try to take some of the steam away from Francis Townsend and his arguments by making that part of the program that FDR is putting into place. This is also going to provide relief for old people. It's going to help with recovery by putting money into the hands of older people so they can retire. And it's also a reform by taking these workers out of the workplace. The jobs that they're working can then be filled by younger people like yourselves. Um, so it's creating more of an open environment for people to get started in jobs and then be able to work their way up without being blocked um, by older people who are forced to work for their survival. In 1935, only about 30% of American farms had electricity. So Congress, with Roosevelt's urging, set up the Rural Electrification Administration. Ten years later, 45% of rural America had electric power. With widespread support from organized labor, minorities, and the public at large, FDR was re-elected as president in 1936. His victory marked the first time most African Americans voted for a Democratic Party candidate. With Eleanor Roosevelt's prompting, Roosevelt appointed the first female ambassador and several women federal judges. Frances Perkins became the first female Secretary of Labor and Mary McLeod Bethune was appointed head of the Office of Minority Affairs in the National Youth Administration, becoming the first African-American woman to head a federal agency. Meanwhile, Mrs. Roosevelt defied the daughters of the American Revolution, publicly resigning her membership when the DAR refused to let Marian Anderson sing in Washington, D.C.'s Constitution Hall because of her color. Instead, Eleanor Roosevelt arranged for the concert to be held on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. So there's stuff happening in that segment that's going to highlight where we're going for the remainder of our course. Number one, notice what's going on with African Americans. They've been finding themselves in a difficult political pl uh, place because they haven't been a lot finding a lot of people who are friendly to them in politics. Many of them voted for Republicans initially because that was the party of Lincoln, but then in the early 1900s they saw both parties drift away from the idea of protecting African Americans' rights. For Franklin Roosevelt, he shows inclinations to help out African Americans, but his New Deal has a number of racist elements as far as who's being helped with jobs and, and who's being taken care of, where African Americans still have complaints with him. But what uh, is very much exciting African Americans is Eleanor Roosevelt. And Eleanor and Franklin's re relationship is really uh, interesting to watch because uh, Franklin Roosevelt had a series of affairs that made their relationship very strained emotionally and romantically, but when it came to professionalism, Eleanor Roosevelt is our first of our modern first ladies who see themselves as active political agents rather than just being hostesses inside the White House. So Eleanor Roosevelt would travel the country to visit with people who are seen as too radical, too extreme, and too dangerous for Franklin Roosevelt. And he was also limited by his, uh, his inability to be able to move around the way he wanted to since he had been diagnosed and paralyzed um, with that polio diagnosis. So when we see Eleanor Roosevelt, she's willing to go visit with labor unions or with immigrants or with African Americans or with women, and, and she's able to bring their stories back to the United States, back to Franklin Roosevelt, and, and, and she's able to influence him to consider uh, groups that have been marginalized in the past um, and include them in the, in the process that you just saw. Um, for you guys also, you should notice, though, if African Americans are becoming a part of the Democratic Party, that's a very difficult place for them to be when also Southern Democrats who are part of that solid South, um, who have also been recently affiliated with the KKK and hold very much still racist viewpoints, 
that's going to cause a lot of tensions within the party. And so the Solid South, within the next few chapters, is going to start splintering um, as they struggle to figure out, are they still Democrats or do they need to find a new home for themselves as well? In the midst of labor unrest, poverty and hardship, Americans still manage to find fun at the movies. For just a quarter, they could forget their troubles in one of more than 15,000 picture palaces. Radio 2 entertained a weary America. Practically every home had a radio, and families gathered to laugh at Burns and Allen and thrill to the drama of Orson Welles' Mercury Theater on the Air. By 1939, the nation seemed to be on the road to economic recovery and Congress cut back on the New Deal unemployment programs since it had gone deeply into debt, providing jobs and aid to Americans. The economy started to improve, but the Republican Party blocked any further relief efforts. Meanwhile, FDR and America, despite wishing to remain neutral, began to realize that war was inevitable in Europe, and very soon it became a reality. Ironically, when America finally entered World War II, her massive investment in manufacturing guns, airplanes, tanks, and ships would finally lift the country out of the Great Depression. So as we wrap up the Chapter 32 lecture, what I'd like to highlight for you is a few different things. Number one, pay attention to the fact that when we look at the Great Depression, we're going to see that economically, America is going to make a, a turnaround during the time of FDR, but it's going to be slow, and that's going to lead to very different interpretations from conservatives or liberals about how you should look at Franklin Roosevelt. When you take a look at, at the curve of the number of people who are unemployed, you're going to notice that America competing against Germany is not going to be keeping up with them. But what you need to also keep in mind is the route that Germany took is a route called fascism. It's the opposite of communism on the political spectrum, um, but it's got some similar attributes with the idea that everybody in a fascist country is going to be working for the benefit of the country itself. And so for Adolf Hitler, when he starts breaking the Treaty of Versailles, he's going to employ all his men, it's either soldiers or factory workers, and they're going to work their way down to zero unemployment because they're going to have very much everybody ramped up in the war effort. It's going to be a massive expenditure of money, but that's going to be built towards militarism. And so you'll see that Germany outpaces us, but they also take a lot of, uh, a lot of things to, uh, into their economy uh, as they change their governmental style, which is definitely not the direction that America would want to go. We're also going to see, though, that with America, that you're going to see that their production throughout the time of FDR is increasing. So our factories are producing, and we're going to see our unemployment shift downward slightly but our problem that we're going to witness is the economy doesn't get better until World War II. So for many conservatives, their argument is going to be that FDR did too much. Liberals will argue that he did too little. And instead, what I'd like to highlight for you is this dip right here called the Roosevelt Recession, where in 1937, FDR starts listening, listening a lot to uh, people who are arguing that the debt load that America has is getting really bad, and we need to dial into that. He decides to cut back a number of the New Deal programs that are providing jobs for, for a number of individuals, and the free market isn't able to pick up the slack of that. And so we see the economy dip again in 1937 as those programs start to disappear. Um, we're going to see that there's a rebound that happens here, but that rebound is the beginnings of America starting to work on arming the rest of the world as we become an arsenal of democracy. So when we study the Great Depression, we all agree that World War II is what truly ends the Great Depression. Um, the big question that we have is between Republicans who argue that FDR was working against recovery and liberals who will argue that he was working in favor of it but perhaps wasn't doing enough because he was too concerned about debt. And for you, if you have a disagreement uh, one way or the other about that, you will be fitting into easily our two political camps of Republicans and Democrats nowadays. For Roosevelt, though, when he studied afterwards, he studied by a guy named John Maynard Keynes. And John Maynard Keynes is going to come up with the philosophy that economically, we have a governmental role that needs to be played in order to get the economy to work the way that it should. So let me draw this out for you for what John Maynard Keynes thinks. And this is going to be called Keynesian economics. He's 
going to argue that unlike the old days where the economy would have ups and downs, like we saw in our Steel Empire game, his argument is that the government should play a direct role in trying to figure out ways to help the economy to get better. For his viewpoint, his belief was that if the economy takes a dip and it starts to crash out, the government shouldn't sit by and do nothing. Instead, what he believes is this is the moment to lower taxes and to increase government spending. The idea is that this will then provide a stimulus for the economy to help it recover, priming the pump, kind of like FDR talked about. In Keynesian economics, then, the idea is you don't want these lows to get too low. Think about our Steel Empire game. You don't want an E market. Going down to a D could be a correction, but an E is a crash. But then also the idea is that this is going to drive you into debt. In order to pay for these programs, you're going to have to borrow an awful lot of money. But according to John Maynard Keynes, he's going to agree with Alexander Hamilton that debt necessarily isn't a bad thing as long as it's being used productively. So for the Keynesian economics viewpoint, when the economy turns this direction, that's the time to then go the opposite way on both of these ideas. This is when you should raise taxes, because at this point people should now have jobs now that the economy is recovered, and this is the time to cut your government programs, because by this point you should have people who are fully able to work jobs, and they shouldn't need the programs that they have anymore. So Keynes would agree with what FDR was doing with like the WPA and the CCC, that those programs are meant to go away, but he would argue that FDR didn't allow the debt load to grow enough in order to actually create the stimulus required to turn the economy around. For many uh, conservatives, though, they will argue that the increase of debt and the stimulus and all that stuff is very much not what the Constitution says that we should be doing, um, and there's nothing really that specifies that that should be the government's role. So that creates for us very much the eternal political debate that we have going on inside of our country right now. What should the appropriate role of the government be when dealing with the economy? But you'll notice also that there's an element going on with FDR and with Keynes where he's trying to figure out not supply-side economics. They're trying to encourage consumer spending. So they're more demand-side economics because they feel like if you have demand, that will then create the requirement for the suppliers of jobs and, and products to keep that moving forward. So for FDR, what he will do is he will keep working um, with the New Deal, but what he is also going to be finding is that there's resistance to this as he moves forward. Pay attention also in your textbook to the idea that there is an Indian New Deal that's created where FDR will recognize Native Americans as being a, a nation within a nation, and he'll start uh, negotiating with them. But then also recognize that now that he has created um, this, this set of programs where the government is now intervening in the economy pretty specifically, there is a fear that government officials might work to try to keep their political positions because they are the, uh, able to then be able, uh, uh, dispensing funds to people throughout the country. So this led to the creation of the Hatch Act, which says that if you are a government official, you are not allowed to actively campaign and try to get people to, to uh, vote for a certain candidate, you're not allowed to use governmental funds for political purposes. You're not allowed to collect campaign contributions from people who are getting money from the programs that you are running, um, except for if you are at the very top of the, the political structures. So if you're somebody inside the cabinet positions um, and, and you're working within these agencies, you're supposed to stay out of politics. By 1938, the feeling is that there, the, the New Deal has gone plenty far and many people are going to feel like it's gone too far. Um, and what they're going to be feeling like is by this point, the economy's gotten better enough that it's not necessary to do uh, stuff that is extreme. Instead, they want to go back more toward the status quo. They're also very nervous about what's happening over in Europe and Asia. And so when you're reading this chapter, notice Manchuria, where Japan is getting very aggressive in Asia, becoming imperialistic, and they're sensing that America does not want to defend China and the open door policy. Germany and Italy are also getting very aggressive during this time, and they're getting the feeling that America does not want to protect the Treaty of Versailles or the League of Nations, and they're also sensing that England and France are very much weakened economically by what happened with the New Deal. Also inside the country, there are a number of people, Republican and Democrat, who are very nervous about what the New Deal is doing. Al Smith, the more conservative uh, uh, Democrat that we had in the 1924 election, uh, sorry, 1928 election, 
he's going to look at this as being just graft, that all these programs are just meant to, to be scams to steal money from the government. Many people are arguing that this is, is outright communism or, or Stalinism, um, that, uh, sorry, uh, not Stalinism, Marxism that is spreading throughout the country. Um, some people are arguing that this is a Jewish conspiracy because FDR does have a number of Jewish advisors, and so they start referring to it in very anti-Semitic terms. Business people are arguing that it's governmental people who are meddling with the economy, um, and they are also witnessing the fact that the federal government has grown very large as a result of the New Deal, and that's going to continue growing from this point forward. You want to know the term bureaucracy, where many people are bureaucrats working within the government who are unelected, um, and their positions are pretty secure because of all these government pro programs that have been created. Our debt is also growing quite a bit, and so from 1932 to 1939 it has grown a ton, and there's a feeling that there's a, a lot of handouts taking place, and there's a fear of creeping socialism. What I'd also like you to keep in mind, though, when you take a look at Franklin Roosevelt, is his attempts to try to take on the Supreme Court, to, to have the, the Democrats in Congress on his team, um, are also seen as heavy-handed, and we're also going to see a states' rights argument being made by his critics. So you've got an overwhelming concern uh, about what's taking place with FDR, especially floating out from the idea that he was not able to fix the, the Great Depression with his New Deal programs, and so many people who are conservative will argue that that's then an indication that his plans were incorrect. For people who are on the opposite side of the spectrum, they will have their counter-arguments and their counter-argument is very much revolving around the idea that we were seeing under Herbert Hoover that the economy wasn't turning, but instead it was still collapsing. And what we saw with FDR on is we're going to see that, that he is going to be put in place not just programs to help turn things with relief and recovery, but his reforms seem common sense. And so what I want you to think about is whether or not you agree or disagree will be determined by your answer to the questions that I was, I was throwing out to you previously in class. Do you feel like this is radical or reasonable? And that'll help you determine where you stand as far as FDR and the criticisms that he has. Many people will also argue that FDR should be seen not as a radical, but instead of taking over private businesses, he bent over backwards to create systems that allowed business owners to be able to keep their businesses while also reforming things so that the scandalous things that they were up to went away. Um, and we're going to see that criticism again with World War II, because when many people point out the debt, um, that FDR is, is racked up right here. It's minuscule compared to how much money they're going to have to spend to win World War II, and virtually everybody agrees that it's World War II itself that is going to create the stimulus for, for the Great Depression end. So many people see this as the argument not that FDR did too much, but that he did too little, too late, to actually create the turnaround that he needed close to 1933 when he went into the office. Many people will also point out that, that he himself felt that like Teddy Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson, that he was actually holding off the radicals who easily could have taken over control of the United States because of the desperate state we were in. But also he held off the conservative radicals to the far right who were fascists um, because they were very much rising in places like Italy and Germany and, and places like that. So for you guys, when you take a look at FDR, you are taking a look at a very controversial individual in U.S. history. For liberals, he's very much the foundation for where the modern Democratic Party uh, got its start. Um, and for conservatives, this has very much uh, been a concern for, of theirs, because by winning four elections in a row, um, he was able to convince Americans that a more involved federal government in their daily lives was not something to be afraid of. And it's created a battle that we've seen ever since, where we've seen conservatives and, and liberals um, battling not just over policies, but also how to interpret this history. So good luck with your studying over the, over the course of this weekend. We will uh, get a chance to talk more about this on Monday night with your review. Um, and then also next week when we wrap this up and move into uh, World War II, um, we'll be able to discuss that more at that time too to, to wrap up FDR. So good luck with your studying. Enjoy your three-day weekend um, and post questions on, uh, on Monday.